If you were a kid growing up in the 90s and early 2000s, chances were you knew you were in for a fun time the moment this logo appeared on your computer's monitor. Humongous Entertainment was one of the leading companies in kids' point-and-click adventure games, and along with Play School, Jumpstart, Living Books, and The Learning Company, helped define children's PC games of the time, as well as got a lot of them into the computers and gaming in general. Whether it was through fun gameplay with creative problem solving or having memorable and colorful characters, their games have certainly left a mark on many people's childhoods and are still fondly remembered to this very day. So, I thought it would be a lot of fun to take a look at the company's history. Now, for this retrospective, I will be taking a look at the history of the Big Four Junior Adventure series as well as the Backyard Sports. And don't worry, I will be covering their other games during this prologue. So with all of that, I am the Media Nutso, and this is the History of Humongous Entertainment. Our story actually begins back at LucasArts, specifically with two key employees game producer Shelley Day, and game designer and programmer Ron Gilbert. They were mostly known at the time for working on many of LucasArts' adventure games, including, but not limited to, Maniac Mansion and the first two Monkey Island games. In fact, it was when they were watching a six-year-old boy play Monkey Island that they took notice that, while he couldn't read any of the dialogue, he was having a lot of fun poking around, solving random puzzles, and opening and closing the doors. This led them to lament the fact that there weren't very many adventure games for kids. Thus, they resigned from LucasArts, and in March of 1992, they went on to found their own company in Woodenville, Washington, Humongous Entertainment, to which they credit ex-LucasArts colleague Tim Schaefer for the suggestion, with Day serving as CEO and President, and Gilbert as the Creative Director. In fact, Going with the name was a conscious choice on their part, as they wanted to be thought of more as a kid's entertainment company rather than an edutainment one. Considering how well their games turned out, that last statement couldn't be any more true. When developing the games, the goal Day and Gilbert had in mind was, again, not to create edutainment games, but rather bring their own children's stories to life. They also apply what they refer to as the principles of adventure games that they learned from their time at LucasArts, where, even though they were aiming the games at kids, they didn't dumb them down or the gameplay. They wanted them to have some level of intelligence and require the players to think, like when they pick up an item that they might need to use later. What a beautiful shell! Herman, I brought you a new shell that doesn't glow. Frabby, Frabby, Frabby! It's wonderful! All of this would come to fruition with the release of their first game, Putt Putt Joins the Parade for the MS-DOS, Mac, and surprisingly, the 3DO. The end result would work out in their favor, as the game received some good scores from critics and sold quite well. It was a good start for the company, but shockingly, it almost ended up being their only game released. You see, they originally wanted to get Electronic Arts, and yes, that Electronic Arts, to help distribute the game on the 3DO. But that got them in trouble with LucasArts, who sued them over violating their agreement with the distribution rights of their game engine, the Script Creation Utility for Maniac Mansion, or SCUM for short. Luckily though, the court settled in Humongous' favor and they were able to continue moving forward. The next year, not only did they release Putt-Putt's second adventure with Goes to the Moon as well as the Fun Pack, they also came up with their second game series, Fatty Bear. And by second series, I mean one adventure game and a single Fun Pack, that was later re-released with Putt-Putt's as the Putt-Putt and Fatty Bear Activity Pack. Why didn't he live to get another game? Well, the person that owned the rights to him didn't want to make another one, and parents were not too keen on the character's name which is why he was later reduced to just background cameos in their other games. Yeah, kind of hard not to blame them for that. In 1994, 
Humongous Entertainment will go through some big changes, starting with making the transition from the MS-DOS to the more powerful Windows system, which would be reflected with the release of their true second big game series, Freddy Fish. Where the previous games utilized pixelated DOS-style graphics, this one will mark as their first game to use fully hand-drawn animation, which will become the main standard for many other games to come as well as introducing their most memorable and recognizable gaming mechanic, Interchangeable Paths. Each time the game was played, players would get a different path to follow, so one wouldn't know which one they were going to get. The next year, not only did they release their third Puppa game and the first one for Windows, Save the Zoo, but they also re-released the DOS games on the system and collaborated with Random Mouse to create a trilogy series called The Junior Field Trips, all released in the same year. Hosted by a new character, Buzzy the Knowledge Bug, he would take the players on the tour of a farm, an airport, and the three different types of rainforests in the world. Interesting fact about the first game, it was originally first released in October of 1994 under the Junior Encyclopedia's label, but it was later updated to be more in line with the other two and was released alongside with the second game. Also, Shelly Day and Ron Gilbert established a new subdivision called Cave Dog Entertainment that would allow them to develop games of alternate genres, their most notable one being Total Annihilation. In 96, they would release their third big game series, Pajama Sam, as well as create a Junior Venture spin-off line called The Junior Arcades, that were basically adaptations of other games, including Breakout, adapting a luggage game from the airport Junior Field Trip, Cubert, Collectathons, and of course, various side-scrolling shooters. Also, during that same year, they'd go through another big change when the whole company was purchased by GT Interactive for $76 million. But even with that purchase, they didn't skip a beat. 1997 would prove to be a big year for Humongous, as they would release three new game series. One was a spy parody aimed more at older kids that would become their fourth big game series, Spy Fox. The second would be the first in a series of junior sports games that would be their fifth big series, Backyard Baseball. And the last were two games that were much younger skewing called Big Thinkers. The best way to describe the last one would be, imagine a trippier version of the Jumpstart series, but with two very enthusiastic childlike teenagers. There's a whole wet world of wonders down here. Look, that clown has something inside it. What could it be? Back with Fatty Bear, as I already mentioned, they only released two games, with the Kindergarten and First Grade Editions. But that wasn't originally the case. They did have a third game, the Second Grade Edition, in the works, but it was cancelled as it proved to be too ambitious for one team to develop three games at once. Also, they were going to develop their games into animated television shows produced by Lancet Media Entertainment that would have premiered in the fall of 1998, as well as make videos and even movies. But it never happened. It kind of a shame, really, as they would have made for some pretty good shows. On a side note, many of the games released that year were dedicated to programmer Brett Barrett, who unfortunately passed away the year prior. Anyways, the following year, they teamed up with Nickelodeon to develop and release six Blue's Clues games, which, due to licensing issues, have never seen a re-release. But, physical copies can be found cheap. In 1999, there would be another big buy-up, but this one would mark the beginning of the end for Humongous Entertainment. In November of that year, GT Interactive was acquired by Infogrames and was renamed Infogrames Inc. However, it didn't immediately start off bad, as in 2000, Humongous would come out with a set of Activity Center games for all, except for Spy Fox, of the Junior Adventures called the One Stop Fun Shop, where one can make various cards, party decorations and hats, and even exclusive stories that can be colored in. But now, this is where the story starts to get a little more complicated. 
By 2000, Ron Gilbert was so fed up with all of Infogrom's executive interference and resistance creating new intellectual properties, including with what would have been their first all CG adventure game, a gas rocket adventure, he and Shelly Day attempted to buy back their company. But the day of their purchase could not have happened at a worse time, as it was at the same time as the dot com bubble collapsed, and they ended up losing all of their funding. Thus, they, along with other key employees, including Dave Grossman, resigned and founded a new company, Who Would Be Entertainment, which didn't last very long. Why? Well, let's just say Shelly Day getting arrested for bank fraud didn't help things out, and they only came up with six titles, their most notable one being Moop and Dreadly in the Treasure on Bing Bong Island. Back at Humongous, things took a turn for the worse, as not long after they left, Infogrom's laid off 82 employees, or about 40% of their staff. On top of that, when they attempted to come up with another new game, Moonbase Commander, Infogrom's was so resistant towards it that they went out of their way to not give it any sort of promotion or even give it a mention at an E3 presentation, resulting in few people knowing about it and the game ended up as a big flop. Man, that is just icy. In May of 2003, Infogrames purchased Hasbro Interactive, who at the time owned the rights to the Atari brand, and thus renamed themselves Atari Inc. shortly afterwards. In that same year, they did release two more junior adventure games, with the 7th Putt Putt and 4th Pajama Sam games respectively, but with one difference. Where the other titles used the Scum Engine, these two, along with the current Backyard Sports games at the time, use the Yaga game engine, and the former two are considered by many to be the worst of their respective series. Though considering their financial state at the time, I don't think anyone, even the crew themselves, could be blamed for how those games turned out. After that, they continued to limp along with more backyard sports games until August of 2005, when the company was sold to the majority stockholder, Infogrames, for $10.3 million on the condition that all titles that Humongous developed be released through March 31st of 2006. And not too long after, the company was officially dissolved. This was most certainly a sad day for both the remaining crew and longtime fans. From there, Infogrames transitioned all of the assets and brands to a new company, Humongous Inc. How original. Now, no longer bound by any of the agreements of Atari Inc., they were going to republish several of the titles along with Majesco Entertainment. Speaking of the latter, in 2008, they attempted to port the first installment of each Junior Adventure series, Sans Puppa, to the Wii, by subcontracting the job out to Mystic Software, who in turn gave it to their Ukrainian post, Mystic Song, and we're we'll getting into a lot of legal trouble. How so? Well, instead of probably porting the games, the Mystic Soft crew just put in a scum VM build without permission, thus violating their general publishing license, and failing to give credit to the scum VM team, resulting in them to file a lawsuit against the company. It didn't help either that the ports themselves were heavily rushed to meet deadlines, and it shows. Find Grandma Grouper's treasure chest, go to the volcano. I'm gonna be rich when I find that treasure. Needless to say, it didn't end well for them, and the Wii ports ended up being short-lived. There were a few other attempts to bring some of them back into the market, like with Freddy Fish ABC Under the Sea for the Nintendo DS in 2008 in Europe, then America two years later. But it was heavily criticized by longtime fans for being purely educational instead of being an adventure game, and for not having the same spirit of the main series, and would end up becoming a failure. This, in turn, discouraged Atari Inc. from making any more attempts to revive the properties. So, is this where Humongous Entertainment's story ends? Nope, not even close. In fact, it would actually get a little better. In 2009, amidst a difficult financial situation, Infogrames, who by then had been renamed Atari SA, filed bankruptcy for three of their American subsidiaries, Atari Inc., Atari Interactive, and of course, Humongous Inc. On July 19, 2013, as part of the resolution proceedings, the Humongous brand, along with most of its assets, 
were transferred to Tomo Inc., while the Backyard Sports series were acquired by the Evergreen Group, and Moon Base Commander was given to Rebellion Developments. Now, with the trademark on their hands, Tomo decided to relaunch the Humongous Entertainment website in January of 2014, and, in collaboration with Night Dive Studios, went on to digitally re-release many of their titles on the digital distribution service, Steam, between April of 2014 and August of 2015, exactly a whole decade after the original company was dissolved. Most recently, they've all been released in the App Store. As you can see, like I said at the start, 28 years after their first release, Humongous Entertainment's games have left their impact with both kids and even adults, mainly those that grew up playing them, thanks to their good writing and humor that even parents can enjoy. So much so, in fact, that Ron Gilbert stated that when the kids went to bed, their parents would be sneaking off to play them as a guilty pleasure. Naturally, this would be reflected in their game sales, as they would go on to sell a combined total of 16 million units and would receive over 400 awards. The crew set out to tell their own kids' stories, and they achieved it in the best way possible. they become the kind of game that just make you feel good replaying them, and knowing what the crew had in mind when making them, it makes them feel even more special than before. Join me next time as we take a look at each of their 5 big game series, starting with the friendliest purple convertible you'll ever meet.